Greatness is found in pure hearts that love Jesus Christ. Good morning. So glad that you're with us today. Uh, before we begin the service, I wanted to spend just a little bit of time catching you up on where the ministry is. Uh, frankly, I think we all are getting the sense that things are starting to return to normal. And I wanted to let you know that we have been working diligently on trying to stay ahead of the return. And so we want to make sure that when we return, uh, we are completely ready to take care of the church family and to provide the best facilities that we can. If you've been in our building before, you know this is not going to be an easy facility to function in and maintain space to keep everyone comfortable, but we are definitely going to do the best we can. So, so I wanted to talk just briefly about what the plan is for the return. Our hope right now is that we will be returning to services here in the building on June 7th. What we're going to do is two services in the morning. We're still playing with the times to try and finalize all of the details. And uh, we're going to be working, too, on figuring out who goes to what services. And so I know there's lots of questions. And let me just simply say this. If you could, uh, two things. Number one, remain flexible. And number two, remain patient. We'll make sure that we've communicated thoroughly with you before we jump back into our services. Some of you may be sitting, listening to this broadcast and concerned that when we return to services, that the online services will no longer be available. And I want to make sure that you know that's actually one of the reasons that we have been delaying our return because we have to bring our building up to speed on technology so that we're able to stay connected with those of you that are not able to come to the building or are not comfortable with coming to building. I want to make sure that you know that there's no expectation for anyone. We're here to service you, to be Christ's servants, and to bring you the gospel. And we're going to do that however we can and whatever is best for you. And so it's really important that we just simply be good to each other in an unprecedented time when a lot of people are biting at each other. And I know that that's not our church family. And so I'm looking forward to this return. I'm excited. I hope you are as well. So again, we'll be doing two services in the morning to reduce the numbers of people that are in the auditorium at a single time. And then we will also be offering that online broadcast. So if you're a guest of ours and you're out of state, you'll still be able to stay well connected with our ministry deep into the future. All right, with all of that said, let's go ahead and move forward into our worship service. I'm excited about what God is going to be doing in your heart today. Yeah. 
right, good morning. If you would, please grab your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 19. As you're finding Matthew chapter 19, I want to talk just a little bit about the message this morning, and more importantly, kind of what we're doing right now. And I alluded to this last week in the message uh, that I introduced you to in Exodus chapter 3, and that was God's call on Moses' life. We looked at the declaration that God is still God. But I believe that in our series on Elijah, many of you, while you're sitting at home, realized that the kingdom isn't about programs, and it's not even about a location. It's about a relationship with God, and so I want to spend several weeks helping you how to have, helping you understand how to have a real relationship with God. I used to assume that people didn't walk with God because they didn't want to, and although I think that's true, I have found that there are many people that don't have a relationship with God, not because they don't want to, but because they don't know how to. And whether you're in that place right now where you'd acknowledge and say, I really don't know how to have a vibrant relationship with God, I think that if we'll spend some time showing you what Jesus taught us about having a relationship with God and what God's Word says about how a relationship with God functions, by the end you will either say, I found what I was looking for, or you'll come to the end and say, I didn't even know that that's what I was looking for, but I definitely needed that. And so Matthew chapter 19, Um, right before I read this passage, let me just briefly say this. What is the difference between the Moseses of the world and then the forgotten children of Israel? And by that I mean, what is the difference between those that God uses and those that abandon God? If you've spent any amount of time in church, you know that there's people that just Don't make it. Uh, Maybe this sermon series has afforded you an opportunity to worship in ways that you haven't in a long time. Maybe you're sitting there listening to this message and you'd say, you know what? I've had a hard time sticking with worshiping God. You'll notice I didn't say religion. Um, We're talking about a relationship with God, not doing church. And you'd say, man, I have always struggled with walking with God and I've I've blamed religion for that. Well, this morning I would like to show you what the difference is. Because if God has given us everything we need, is it a viable excuse to blame somebody else if the gospel is that good? If Jesus has given us everything we need, can we genuinely say that it was my circumstances that caused me to not walk with God? I'd like to show you what it is in you that has prohibited your relationship with God. And it's not complicated, but that doesn't mean that it's not difficult. Matthew chapter 19, Jesus introduces us to the single difference between those that thrive and those that flounder spiritually. If you would please look at verse uh, 27, Just to kind of give you an idea, I want to set just a really brief context. Again, we're not going to study Matthew 19 like we uh, study passages of Scripture. We'll be doing that in Luke chapter 7. But I I want you to get the context of what Jesus is about to say. So you see in verse 27 that Peter uh, answered and said unto him, that's to Jesus, Behold, we have forsaken all and have followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And this is after someone else came to Jesus, but wasn't willing to give everything up. And so Jesus said, you're not, you're not worthy of the kingdom. And so Peter's listening to this, and he's thinking, hey, we did. So what does that mean for us? And if you look, Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you that uh, you have followed me in the, in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory. Uh, you shall sit a, upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or fathers, or mothers, or wife, or children, or lands for my name's sake. Did you hear that list? Some of you have trusted in Christ, and it's cost you your family. And Satan has caused you to believe that somehow you were wrong, because by following Jesus, it cost you everything. But Jesus says that sometimes that is the cost. The question isn't whether or not that cost is right. 
The question is whether or not Jesus is worth it. He goes on to say that all who have forsaken all of these things shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Verse 30 is the key. Look at verse 30. He says, many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. When I was a kid, we used to use this on each other all of the time. And maybe you did too. If you grew up as a Christian and you heard this verse, if somebody cut in line or you ended up in the back of the line and someone turned to you and said, ma ha ha, I'm in front of you. You whipped out this verse and you said, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. But what does it actually mean? Is God like this goofball, sadistic master of the universe that likes to mess with people? Oh, you made it to the front of the line? Oh, sorry, we're going to start at the back of the line. It's outside of his character. We don't see God using his position to mess with people. So what does it mean? Why does Jesus say that those who are first in this life will be last in the next, but those that are last in this life shall be first in the next. When you look at what Jesus um, says about the rich man and Lazarus, we have this picture. And the most important question we could ever ask, it's a question we're going to dig into in a couple weeks, is the question, why? But I'd like to experiment with this question and ask this. Why did Jesus say this? And I believe we can find the answer if you'll turn to Luke chapter 7. Sometimes I like, to, um, I like to hold the answer back and then drop it as a surprise because it's something that you're not expecting. But I believe that what we're going to learn is so critical that I don't want to withhold it as a surprise and then offer it as a payoff later because you paid close attention. I think you need to hear up front what Jesus is talking about. And so let me state it plainly and then show it to you in this text. In the life of someone who comes to Christ. Listen carefully. There is no room for dignity in the kingdom of Christ. If the expectation is that you're going to assemble yourself as good as you possibly can. And then come to Jesus because you have found him satisfactory. And that he's going to then finish off something that you've started which was already pretty good. That is to say, if you plan on adding Jesus to your life, he's the first addition that falls off. There is no room for dignity in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Too many people have come to Jesus thinking that they would treat him as an accessory and he never lasts. Look at this story in Luke chapter 7. And uh, to give you the historical context, uh, Jesus has, he's, I don't know any better way to say it than to say that he's flexed his majesty. Uh, he has done some pretty awesome things leading up to Luke chapter 7 that's, that people in his culture are well aware that he's done it. Uh, in Luke chapter 5, uh, verses 12 through 15, uh, he heals, the scripture says that he heals many lepers. It is really important to understand that in Leviticus chapter 13, the law actually tells us if somebody has leprosy and then they're made whole, here's what you're supposed to do to make them whole. And it's important to understand that Leviticus chapter 13 became a very dusty passage because leprosy had no medical solution. If somebody had leprosy, at the time of Christ and before, and then was made whole, the only explanation was that God healed them. We see a couple of very brief examples of that, but we never find anyone in Scripture who is terminally ill with leprosy and then is made whole until Jesus Christ comes. And he doesn't just heal one, kind of like you know how he raised Lazarus from the dead? He doesn't just heal one leper. He actually heals many different lepers. In chapter number 6, he heals a crippled hand, uh, in chapter, uh, same in chapter number 6, he takes care of the multitude. In chapter number 7, he heals the centurion's servant. Um, and in chapter number 7, he raises one from the dead. And so by the time we get to the passage that we're going to look at, this guy knows all of the stuff that Jesus has done. Maybe you have come to Jesus because you've been impressed. And I want to make sure that you understand this. 
that is not enough. Let me go ahead and show you the two characters, and then what I'd like to do is contrast these two characters. And as we do, would you allow yourself to plug into one or the other? Force yourself to say, I'm this one or I'm that one. And be honest and determine whether or not you have come to Christ with dignity or not. Because if you've not come to Christ desperate, then you will not need what Jesus has to offer. Luke chapter 7 Verse number 36, and one of the Pharisees desired him. We know why he desired him, because he found Jesus impressive. Now I will tell you this, Jesus is impressive, but he didn't come to impress you. One of the Pharisees desired him, that he would eat with him. He went into the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to meet. Character number one is the Pharisee. Character number two enters the room in verse 37. Behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew what, uh, that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. Uh, I know that our church family has, has heard me describe this before, um, but kind of like the, uh, the best way that I can describe this for you is that you understand what's actually going on with this meal. This was a public event, and often public figures would honor another public figure by bringing them into the house and then, figuratively speaking, leave the doors open to the meal. It'd kind of be like having a miniature wedding reception, but inviting the whole town to come out to it. And it wasn't expected that the whole town would come, but that you kind of knew your place. Am I of the level with the Pharisees that, you know, I would come in? And by the way, Jesus talks about this, how... Pharisees would set up for a meal. It'd be one of these open-door meals where they had invited a dignitary over. Often it was, it was spiritual or religious, but sometimes it was political. And they would do one of these open-door dinners, and sometimes they would set rooms apart. And Jesus warns, and he says, don't ever put yourself in the main room. Better to put yourself in the back room and have the head of the table call for you to come to the front room. That's one of these meals. It's an open-door meal that the Pharisee is having. It's kind, of, it's, it's kind of like an invitation. I'm super important, and I think that this other guy is super important, but we're going to have a meal, and it's going to be a show. You can come. Now, only those who had been given an invitation were allowed to sit at the table, and then some were able to actually come who didn't receive an invitation, but if they were welcomed into the home, they could literally stand around and watch them eat. Because it wasn't necessarily the eating, but the conversing that everyone was there for. It's a big deal that this Pharisee, a leader in the community, has extended this invitation to Jesus. It's like having a fundraising banquet for a political breakout. If I honor you with a fundraiser, you're, you're going to be paved. You're going to be set. You won't, you, know, you won't need anything else. And so... It's this opportunity for Jesus to show himself, and the Pharisee has given him a platform to do so. Now, it's for Jesus to succeed or to mess up. And the question from the Pharisee's perspective is, which one is it? All of these things are super critical in understanding what takes place here. But let me just simply say this. As we work through, we're going to contrast three areas, three layers of these two individuals. And before we go any further in this story, Let's first contrast their lives. The Pharisee is a religious leader and a good man. Scripture calls her a sinner. She was one who sold her body. And here's the question. Which career would you take? All of our impulses say, I'd much rather be a respected leader in the community than someone who works the back alleys of Eight Mile Road. Contrasted lives. They couldn't be more different from each other. One appears to have made it and the other appears to have absolutely lost it. We function on pride. But scripture warns of the danger of pride. Remember, Moses came to God curious 
How good of an idea do you think it is to come to Jesus, curious? Walter Cronkite, some of you are going to remember his name. Some of you need to Google his name, and it just depends on how old you are. But Walter Cronkite recalls the following incident. Uh, He was sailing back on his fancy sailboat. He was sailing back down the Mystic River in Connecticut. And he was following the channel's tricky turns through an expanse of shallow water. And Walter said, I'm reminded of a time that a boatload of young people sped past my wife and I, and its occupants were shouting and waving their arms. Oh, I waved back, cheerfully greeting. And my wife said, do you know what they were shouting? Uh, Why, yes, it was, hello, Walter, I replied. And she said, no, they were shouting, they were shouting, low water, low water. Walter went on to say, such are the pitfalls of Fame and egotism. The truth is, we would spend everything we had just to maintain what other people think of us. No one is comfortable with being a failure. And so immediately the stage is set between the two contrasted lives, the Pharisee and the lady. And if I asked you right now, pick one, which one would you pick? We move forward in this story from the contrasted lives to the contrasted behavior. Let's continue to read. In verse 37, Behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. So, She's not one of the invited dignitaries, but she's heard about the open door meal, and so she wants to go and see Jesus. She has a plan, and so she just walks in the room. And to kind of, I guess, paint the picture for you so that you have the full image, I want you to imagine that the area, the dining area, would have been as big as the Pharisee could afford, which would have declared how great he was. And the table would have been huge, and everyone would have been sitting, not in a chair like we know, but on like a a pillow, kind of reclined. They often sat on their left side because it was best for digestion, and so you would lean and have a conversation on one of these leaning pillows. And so they're sitting around this table, and there's probably a lot of guests that the Pharisees have invited. It's possible that it's just Jesus and the Pharisee, Because that might look a little bit more impressive if it's just the two of them. Either way, there would have been people standing around. Because you read this and you say, how did this lady just walk into the house? Was she trespassing? It was an open door meal. There were many people that were allowed and many people that were invited. But know this, she was neither invited or allowed. That's why scripture says she's a sinner. She doesn't belong there. So we move forward in this story. She knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster box of ointment. So this woman comes in, and she's carrying a box. She stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of his head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Verse 39, now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, this man... If he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Contrasted lives. One sits at the table while the other is washing Jesus' feet with the hairs of her head, crying on his feet, kissing his feet. You don't have to go far back to see how I feel about feet. We don't just have their contrasted lives. The two positions that each has created for each other, and by the way, spend some time judging them in their mind. Isn't the Pharisee where he is because he did it right? And isn't the woman where she is because she did it wrong? Can I say this under Christ? Does it even matter? You'll find out. But it's not just the positions. Now we can look at their behavior. This isn't, 
The lady who sits in the pew upright, dressed right, looking right, this is the one that comes to the front and starts crying so loud she's drowning out the piano that's playing during the offertory. He sits there with his dignity. He's afforded the meal. He's paid for the house. He's invited the guest. And he's being respectful in a part of his community. She's a mess. Both are projecting their inward conditions. And yet, might I say this, and you're going to see this. Imagine a massive, beautiful, gorgeous oak tree. The kind that's taken 90 years to stretch its branches and fill itself with leaves. And imagine a rinky-dink Charlie Brown Christmas tree that's just been planted in fresh soil. Here's a question. Which one of those two trees needs water to survive? It's amazing how at the beginning of the story it appears that the Pharisee has all the advantages and the sinner, uh, the sinful woman has all the disadvantages. And yet remember what I said, there is no room for dignity in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Dignity destroys relationships with God. Did you hear what I said? Dignity destroys relationships with God. We have contrasted their lives. We have contrasted their behavior. Now watch what the master does. As only God can do. Man looks on the appearance. God says to Samuel as David is being chosen to be the next king, but God looks on the heart. Verse 40. Remember, The Pharisee has brought Jesus in and he's trying to evaluate him. Is he as great as it appears that he is or isn't he? And the Pharisee says, no, he's not. Because if he was, he wouldn't let this filthy woman touch him. So then in verse 40, Jesus hears these thoughts. It's so cool. And also scary. If he heard the Pharisee's thoughts, he hears yours too. Even right now while you're listening to this message. Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say to thee. Now here's what's crazy. Remember in verse 39 what the Pharisee has concluded. He ain't the real deal. And yet, do you know what word he uses when Jesus talks to him, when he addresses him? Simon, I have something that I want to tell you. What what does Simon say back? The word is curios, and it's translated master. Now hold on. In verse 39, he said, he's not as good as he claims to be. And yet when Jesus talks to him, he says, master, how many people come to church? Not because they need Christ, but because they're hoping to maybe add him, and they're just not that impressed. And yet they'll still sit in the pew and say amen when the preacher starts yelling. Oh, curious. God knows those that love him. And God knows those that need him. And it cannot be faked with lip service. Master, say on. Because what Jesus is going to do is he's going to contrast their hearts. And that can't be faked. Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have somewhat to say to thee. And he said, Master, say on. Verse 41, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. Now this translates no matter what. We can do dollars. One owes $500, one owns owes $50, or better yet, do it with tens of thousands. So one owes 500000 and the other owes 50000 When they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus didn't come into the world to prove that he was awesome. He came to forgive us for everything that we've done. This is why Jesus died. The question isn't if he died or if he rose again, but why? Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. The Apostle Paul said this, of whom I am chief. Is Jesus your Savior? You're listening to this and you'd say, I don't know. If you don't know that he's your Savior, then he's not. Because Jesus says in John chapter 3, you must be born again. I was seven years old when I cried out and asked Jesus to save me in my parents' bedroom with my mom discipling me, leading me to the feet of Christ. When I cried out and said, would you please forgive me? I want to be one of your children. Save me. And he did. Not because I'm good enough, but because Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. He's paid for my sin so that I don't have to. When they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that uh, he to whom he forgave most... <laughs> And he said, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman. Catch the imagery here. The woman didn't host the dinner. Simon did. It wasn't the sinner. It was the Pharisee. And up until this point, the Pharisee has had the master's attention. The master has offered it to the Pharisee. But now he turns all of his posture away from Simon to the woman. Why? Because the ground is equal at the cross. And Christ is not interested in those that are curious about Him. He wants those who know that they need Him. If you want God's attention, be the woman. He turns away from Simon and He turns to the woman. And He says this, Seest thou this woman? Now he's looking at her, but he's talking back over to Simon. Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, and thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. The importance of Jesus in your life is measured by how badly you need him. There are far too many in the world that are dignified instead of desperate. He said unto her, Now, before we read this, can you imagine what this woman has experienced? We don't know much, but we know she's come to Jesus. She's going to embarrass herself coming into this meal. She carries an expensive box of ointment. And she knows she doesn't belong there, so she doesn't say a word. She doesn't ask for his help. She slips in down to where his feet are, extended at the table, and she starts washing them and wiping them and crying and starts kissing on his feet. And when she gets done, wiping off the dirt from the ground with her hair and kissing his feet out of gratitude, she takes the ointment and she pours them over his feet in stone silence. All the time the Pharisee's thinking, he's not as good as I thought he was. No, Simon, you're right, he's not. He's better. Because while you were hoping he would impress you, he is about to rescue her. He turns to this woman and he says, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? I will tell you who he is. He is God in flesh. The lion of the tribe of Judah. The son of the King David. Rightful heir to the throne. And the slain lamb 
for all of heaven to see. He is my Savior, He is my Master, and He's my best friend. That is the one who forgave her sins that day. And these fools didn't see it. My question is, do you? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. And what other words do we have but wow? You contrast their lives and everybody wants to be a Pharisee. You contrast their behavior and still everyone wants to be a Pharisee. And I'm telling you, that's why everyone misses the gospel. Because when you look at their heart, here is the difference. Dignified and desperate. And remember what I said. There are only two options. There are no others. And so my question is this. Are you dignified or are you desperate? And we'll know when the sermon ends and you choose to respond. If you spend no time with Christ today alone, you are dignified and not desperate. Remember this, Christ did not come to satisfy idle curiosity. He came to rescue people that were dying. And I am one of the ones that he has come to rescue. And I love him for it. If you find yourself less than enthusiastic about the gospel, might I suggest you have come to Christ with just a little too much dignity. Corrie Ten Boom in her book, and if you don't know who Corrie Ten Boom is, would you please spend the afternoon researching her? What an awesome testimony. What proof that loving God isn't conditioned on how much we're enjoying ourselves. This is a woman who, because of her Christian faith, survived the Holocaust and led many people to Christ and changed a lot of lives with her writing. Corey Ten Boom wrote in her book, Each New Day, that when she says this, when I saw uh, Saju, uh, Saju Sundar Singh, again, an amazing evangelist, a world evangelist and missionary who led scores, uncountable numbers of people to Christ, an amazing story. Uh, when, um, when Sundar Singh was a boy, really, he was a boy, he said to God, if you don't show yourself to me, I am going to throw myself on the railroad tracks tomorrow and I'm going to die. Because there's no point in living if there is no God. And that night he had a dream. and He met Jesus Christ. That next day, rather than dying on the railroad tracks, he accepted Christ as Savior. Immediately, his family rejected him. They were Buddhists. And he was being raised to be a Buddhist, but the Buddha wasn't showing himself. And so he became a child of God and a follower of Jesus Christ. His father disowned him, and his brother tried poisoning him. And the townspeople started throwing snakes through his window to try and get the poisonous snakes to bite him in his sleep. And so a German missionary rescued him out of his home, he was baptized at the age of 16 and began traveling for the sake of the gospel in the late 1800s. He led scores of people to Christ and was coming to the end of his ministry when Corey Ten Boom met him in person. Boy, wouldn't it have been great to have been at that lunch in. Corey says this, when I saw Sanju, uh, Sanju Sundar Singh in Europe, he had completed a tour around the world and I heard people ask him, doesn't it do harm you getting so much honor? And Sadju's answer was this, uh, no. Uh, the donkey went into Jerusalem and they put garments on the ground before him. He was not proud. He knew it was not done to honor him, the donkey, but Jesus who was sitting on his back. When people honor me, I know it is not me, but the Lord who does the job. I want Christ to be honored because I am telling you whether you believe me or not, he has rescued me. He is good. He's better than anything else you're ever going to find. Are you dignified or desperate? That will change 
what this pandemic has done in your life. Father, thank you for the message. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to confront us beyond our natural default. For Father, we are good at defending ourselves, but that is not the truth. That, Almighty Father, is why the dignified don't belong in the kingdom of Christ. Because anyone that's dignified isn't tuned in with reality. Everybody needs Jesus. No one can stand on your holy ground based on personal merit. Everyone is a mess. But you are willing to save anyone. And all I can say is praise be to God. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I would encourage you, before we just stop the video and move on, I realize some of you are going to be disappointed to hear this. No bloopers this week. Ditch your dignity and become desperate at the feet of Christ. And fall in love with Him now. Not like you could use him, but like you absolutely need him. And may God richly bless the day that you have lying before you.